Welcome to the Arnold A. Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies celebration of Peace Land uh, with uh, the author and institute member Severino Tessere and uh, discussant Jack Snyder. Uh, it's become an institute tradition to celebrate when one of our members publishes a new book, and we're especially proud to do this with Peace Land, Severino's second book. Uh, in our first book, Trouble with the Congo, was a hard act to follow. Uh, since it won prestigious prizes and was widely and enthusiastically praised. Uh, but Peaceland is no letdown, and some early reactions see it as even better. Uh, and here tonight, you'll get an idea why. Uh, and the Institute would like to thank the event's co sponsors the Center for International Conflict Resolution, the Department of Political Science at Barnard, the Institute of African Studies, and the Earth Institute's AC4. Advanced Consortium on Cooperation, Conflict, and Complexity. Jack and Severine, take it away. Welcome uh, to our book event and wine tasting. Uh, Severine Atasser is a member of the Saltzman Institute and an assistant professor of political science at Barnard College. Uh, she's the author of The Trouble with the Congo, Local Violence and the Failure of International Peace Building. It's Cambridge University Press, 2010. A uh, controversial book that argued that um, peace builders in the Congo missed the boat by focusing on trying to turn Congo, Congo's central state institutions into a democracy while ignoring what the problems uh, really were, such as uh, land fights in uh, the local level. Uh, this book uh, caused a very big uh, splash, as uh, will her new book, uh, Peace Land, which we have right over there on the table uh, for you to look at and if you'd like to, uh, to buy after the talk for uh, $25 cash only, ATM machine down on the fourth floor if you came a little light in the wallet uh, tonight. Severine uh, received her BA from Sorbonne University. Uh, her Masters in International Affairs from the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia, yay team, uh, and her PhD from NYU. So one of the reasons that she's been able to write with such authority uh, on these important and uh, controversial topics of uh, peace building and humanitarian affairs in the developing world, particularly Congo, is that she paid her dues. She lived the life. Her uh, professional affiliations include uh, not only Yale University, but also Action Against Hunger, Doctors Without Borders, Doctors of the world, and she worked for the United Nations. So uh, Severine has been on the front lines. Uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, the tough love that she shows to the peace building professionals in the book Peace Land uh, has been well received, even by audiences of those professionals themselves, because uh, they know that Severine really knows what she's talking about because uh, she lived the life. And so she's going to share that with you right now. Thank you so much, Jack, for the introduction. Thanks to the Sazman Institute for organizing this event, and thanks to all of the co-sponsors. I think there were five co-sponsors. It's, it's very nice. And many thanks to all of you for being here tonight, despite the beautiful weather. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be here and celebrate the launch of my new book, Peace Land. So I'm going to spend about half an hour giving you an overview of the main argument of the book. Uh, then we'll have another half hour to discuss the book all together. And then uh, I think the plan is to continue informally and enjoy the wine and the lovely appetizers at the back of the room. 
So let me tell you to start, let me tell you a few words about what motivated the book, what got me started, and five years later eventually resulted in my new book, Peace Land. As Jack mentioned, I have, sp I have spent the past 15 years studying international peace building initiatives, mostly in the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, and also in various other African and non-African countries. And during this fieldwork, I constantly witnessed a puzzling pattern. International interveners kept using, reproducing, and perpetuating ways of working that they themselves widely view as inefficient, ineffective, or even counterproductive. And by interveners, I mean expatriates who work in peace building. So that includes donors, diplomats, peacekeepers, um, other United Nations or African Union staff members, and the foreign staff of international and non-governmental organizations. And by peace building, I mean any and all actions that help promote peace during and after a conflict. So when I say peace building, I include all of the actions that diplomats or United Nations staff members would prefer to categorize as peacemaking or peacekeeping. So let me give you a couple of examples of this kind of puzzling pattern that recur. It is now conventional wisdom that local ownership is essential for successful peace building, but local stakeholders are rarely included in the design of international programs. Scholars and practitioners regularly emphasize that using universal peace building templates is ineffective and that context sensitivity is crucial. And yet, interveners often use models that have worked in other conflict zones and that are not appropriate for the specific local conditions. Local people and interveners themselves deplore the expatriate's tendency to live in a kind of bubble where they interact mostly with other expatriates and where they lack contact with host populations. And yet, this phenomenon still recurs in virtually all areas of intervention. Why? The persistence of these inefficient modes of operation is to me all the more puzzling because, as you know, interveners are not indifferent or callous. Most of them do care about the effectiveness of their actions. They're not stupid. Most of them are intelligent, well-read, well-educated people. Some of them even have a master or a PhD from Columbia University, and many of them actually are, are my former students. Um, and they're not even oblivious to the consequences of their standard practices. Some of them are actually very uncomfortable with the way international peace building operates on the ground. So my book is an attempt at understanding why interveners contribute to perpetuating modes of operation that they know, that we all know, are inefficient, ineffective, or even counterproductive. What I also found striking when I was in the field is that a number of individuals and organizations ignore or even actively challenge the international peace builders' dominant practices and they suggest alternative modes of operation. And to me, the existence of these exceptional cases raises two questions. First, what can we learn from them in terms of increasing the effectiveness of international peace building? And second, why haven't they managed yet to convince their colleagues to adopt the alternative modes of operation that have proved to be more effective? So identifying the factors that impact the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of international peace building is of critical importance to scholars, to practitioners, and of course to people living in conflict zones. It's true that International actors can succeed only when warring parties are ready to stop using violence and when local, national, and regional peace building capacities are strong enough to make peace sustainable. But despite their limitations, external contributions can make the difference between war and peace, and that's really important. There has been a number of studies at the macro level and at the micro level, including by people in this room, that have shown that international support significantly increases the chances of successful peace building. 
So when we look at the usual explanations for the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of international peace building, we see that they focus on material constraints, on vested interests, and on the imposition of liberal templates and values. Well, what I found in my research, and really the central message of the book, is that the everyday dimensions of international peace efforts on the ground also strongly impact the effectiveness of intervention efforts. And when I mean everyday dimensions, I really mean mundane elements, such as the expatriate social habits, standard security procedures, and habitual approaches to collecting information on violence. I also look at the influence of the informal and the personal on formal professional initiatives. And in my book, I demonstrate that everyday practices shape the overall intervention from the bottom up. They enable, they constitute, they help reproduce the macro level strategies, policies, institutions, and discourses that other political scientists usually study. They also explain the existence and perpetuation of ways of working that interveners themselves widely view as inefficient, ineffective, or even counterproductive. And I want to clarify from the start that my approach and the existing explanations are not mutually exclusive. Rather, they're complementary. Another very important point is that my argument is not that we should eliminate support for international peace building altogether. There is, in fact, a, a wide consensus among scholars and host populations that external actors and external expertise are often, not always, but often necessary for successful peace building. External actors, foreign actors, have a number of distinct advantages in conflict zones, uh, the most important of which I list on the slide. So what we need is not to forfeit these contributions, but rather to think about how we can increase the effectiveness of international efforts. So in the rest of this presentation, uh, I'll talk extremely briefly about my theoretical contributions and research methods, really just one minute. Um, and then I'll spend most of my time telling you about my findings. So I will first uh, explain how interveners construct knowledge of their areas of deployment, and I will trace the impact that this process of knowledge construction has on peace building effectiveness. I will move on to identifying the everyday elements that make possible the specific dynamics of knowledge construction and that create very firm boundaries between interveners and host populations. And again, I will trace the impact that these everyday elements have on peace building effectiveness. And I will conclude by summarizing, of course, the implications of my analysis. So I won't elaborate on the main theoretical contributions for the sake of time, but I have listed them on the slide here. I'm going to talk about them as I proceed with presenting the findings, and I'm of course more than happy to, tell you, to give you more details during the discussion if you're interested. And still for the sake of time, I'll go very briefly on my research methods. So basically, the way I went about researching the book is that I spent several years conducting ethnographic research in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So one year specifically for this project, and then I used the material I had from, other, from my other book. So, and, I, and, and the Congo, as you know, is uh, the deadliest conflict since World War II, largest ongoing humanitarian crisis in the world. So several years in Congo, as well as briefer research visits to Burundi, Cyprus, Israel and the Palestinian territories, uh, South Sudan, and Timor-Leste. And I also draw on my own experience as an intervener in Afghanistan, Kosovo, and Nicaragua, and obviously on practitioners' reports and academic writings on other international interventions. And in my main field sites, I collected these four kinds of data that I have listed on the slide. But let's go to the exciting part, which is the findings. So let's first focus on the struggle over which and whose knowledge matters in Peaceland. In the current international system, 
the most valued expertise is that of interveners trained in peace building, humanitarian and development techniques, and with extensive experience in a variety of conflict zones. In contrast, and although there are exceptions, the knowledge of country specialists is much less valued, and the knowledge of local people is usually trivialized. International and non-governmental organizations, just like diplomatic and donor missions, usually do not rely on anthropologists or historians who could help interveners gain an in-depth understanding of their work environment. Instead, they hire operational experts who have done the same technical jobs before. In terms of promotion and status, intervention structures value the number of missions in different countries rather than the amount of time one spends in a particular mission. And in fact, the interveners who stay too long in a specific place are considered to have gone native, and they are thus discredited. The consequence is that of all the expatriate peace builders that I met, only a few had pre-existing knowledge of their countries of deployment. All of the others had been hired for their substantive and technical capacities. So valuing thematic knowledge of a country-specific expertise results from various social dynamics, including the process of professionalization of international peace building, which has increased the effectiveness of intervention programs on the ground. But valuing thematic expertise over local knowledge also results in standard ways of working in the field that decrease the effectiveness of international efforts. For instance, it legitimates the deployment of people who do not speak any of the local languages, even though on the ground, everyone identifies the intervener's lack of linguistic ability as one of the main obstacles to effective peace building. It also leads to high rotation among interveners which has a lot of negative consequences, such as a lack of understanding of local context and loss of institutional memory. Valuing thematic expertise over local knowledge also asserts the superiority of the international staff, who are viewed as having the consequential expertise over local employees. In virtually all aid and peace building organizations, whether diplomatic, international, or non-governmental, expatriates are in management positions, and local people make up the staff. Very few local people make it into leadership positions in their countries of origin. To move up the hierarchy, they have to go abroad and become expatriates. And let me tell you a story to illustrate how the very fact of being local changes the way interveners relate to a person and his ideas. So one of my interviewees, Michel, was a Congolese businessman. And Michel is from a mixed background. He has Belgian, Portuguese, and Congolese ancestors. And Michel was frustrated at the way interveners behaved toward him and toward other Congolese elites. He thought that interveners were talking down to local counterparts and that they didn't take local ideas into account. So during a meeting abroad, Michel conducted an experiment. Instead of introducing himself as Congolese, as he usually did, he pretended that he came from Puerto Rico. The approach in the meeting, he said, was completely different. He had much more credibility and much more influence when he passed as an outsider. Another consequence of the fact that thematic knowledge matters more than local expertise is that intervention structures very rarely solicit local input in the design and plannings of their efforts. And this creates resentment among local populations, and it is at the root of the phenomenon of local contestation, resistance, and adaptation that lead to the failure of so many projects and programs. So, of course, local people uh, regularly resist international programs for their own benefits, uh, to pursue, for instance, their own personal, political, economic, social agendas, or just because they don't care about building peace. But 
not all local people have this kind of vested interests. And instead, most local people would truly benefit from more stable conditions, and many of them truly care about building peace in their countries. So we need to understand why the people who would in fact benefit from successful international efforts instead reject or distort them. And the premium is the main reason, is the, um, the, the, the premium that interveners place on thematic expertise over local knowledge. In all of the countries in which I worked, local stakeholders complained that international peace builders were arrogant and that they provided aid in a humiliating manner. And my interview was emphasized that the arrogance resided in thinking that the international ways of working are better than the local ones, and in failing to pay attention to local ideas. And what's absolutely fascinating for the research on international peace building is that I heard this kind of criticisms against all kinds of international programs. So not only the programs that were obviously shaped by liberal values, uh, programs that, for instance, insist upon organizing elections, but also programs that had no relationships with liberalism, such as programs that built foreign rather than local models of toilets to respond to water and sanitation emergencies. And my interviewees were very clear. They say that they do not resist or reject the international programs because of their content, such as the supposed Western or liberal characters of the program. Instead, they reject the very act of imposition, regardless of whether or not they like the strategies and the values that the program convey. And the international and non-governmental organizations that fight against this trend are excellent illustrations of the advanta advantages inherent to valuing local knowledge on par with thematic expertise. The few comparative evaluations of their efforts that exist show that these organizations are much more effective at promoting initiatives that are locally owned and locally supported and therefore effective and sustainable. The next chapter of the book studies the everyday manner in which in these circumstances the international peace builders, those that are not exceptions, make sense of their environments. And I show that interveners face multiple obstacles when they try to collect and analyze data on their areas of deployment, and I trace the key consequences of the resulting lack of in-depth knowledge of local context. And one of these key consequences is that the lack of understanding of local conditions entices international peace builders to rely on simple and often overly simplistic narratives to design their intervention strategies. So dominant narratives offer a useful way out of the predicament that international peace builders face given the poor quality of the information and analysis that they have. Dominant narratives emphasize a few themes on which to focus. And interveners can then believe that they have a grasp of the most important features of the situation instead of feeling lost and deprived of the knowledge that they need to properly accomplish their work. So they are useful, but I develop an in-depth case study of the impact of dominant narratives on the conflict in Congo to illustrate the perverse consequences of this practice. So in brief, in, um, in, in 2010 and 2011, uh, um, and it's still relevant for now, three narratives dominated the discourse on Congo and oriented the intervention strategies there. These narratives focused on a primary cause of violence, the illegal exploitation and trafficking of natural resources, a main consequence, sexual abuse of women and girls, and a central solution, reconstructing state authority. These narratives achieved prominence because they suggested straightforward explanations for the violence, because they also suggested straightforward solutions, and because they resonated 
with foreign audiences. And thanks to, the, and thanks to these dominant narratives, foreign and Congolese elites have managed to put the Congolese conflict on the agenda of influential decision makers in capital cities and its headquarters. So that's fantastic. But the reliance on these dominant narratives and on the solutions that they recommended has also led to results on the ground that clashed with their intended purposes, and that includes an increase in human rights violations. The focus on mineral resources exploitation has diverted attention away from other causes of violence, and thus it has decreased the overall effectiveness of the international peace efforts. The focus on sexual violence has raised the status of sexual abuse. It has transformed it into an effective bargaining tool for combatants, and therefore it has increased its uses. And the focus on state building has merely enabled the Congolese government and the Congolese army to become more effective perpetrators of human rights violations and other kinds of abuses against Congolese people. And a number of Congolese intellectuals I interviewed for this project, along with the exceptional individuals and organizations that I mentioned before, have tried to reintroduce more complexity in the discourse on Congo, but thus far without success. So the second part of my book studies the everyday elements that make possible the counterproductive practices and narratives that I document in the first part of the book. And I look at the intended consequences of this practice, such as enabling interveners to function in conflict zones and enabling their organizations to help the host country build peace. But I also look at the unintended consequences, such as the fact that these everyday routines construct and maintain firm boundaries between interveners and local populations. And the fact that these routines perform, make visible, and reinforce an image of the intervener's superiority over local populations, which, of course, these populations strongly resent. So, for the sake of time, let me focus on the three elements that are the most influential in constructing boundaries between interveners and local populations. The first element is that international interveners share a common official goal to help the country of intervention and its people. And it's obvious from the quote that I put on the slide here, we're all part of a club, we're all here to help Congo. So there are, of course, a lot of internal differences in the process of reaching this common goal. There are also different degrees of motivation. But the shared objective delineates the boundaries of the intervener's club. It defines who belongs to the community and who does not belong to the community. Um, foreign business people, for instance, are excluded for the simple reason that they do not share the same official goal. So the interveners group include people coming from all kinds of professional, national, organizational, and religious backgrounds. And what's really important is that the presence of this community of interveners uh, does not preclude the existence of the, the internal differences and tensions and divisions that other scholars have documented. And if you're interested during the discussion, I'm happy to explain how the similarities coexist with the differences. But what's really interesting and what's really important is that on the ground, two elements transform this loose group with a lot of internal divisions and tensions into an actual block with firm boundaries. The first element is that interveners share a common experience of life in conflict zones. And that goes well beyond the, the characteristics that we all know about like the fact that interveners drive in big SUVs, that they have favorite bars, inside jokes, favorite topics of discussion. Beyond these superficial characteristics, I show that the sense of belonging to a community is rooted in the very fact of being a foreigner living and working with no family life constant fear, lack of basic facilities, and a job that is usually emotionally draining. And the quote that I put on the slide 
illustrates uh, what I heard during my interviews and what I observed and experienced during my field work. In war situations, you're in it together. In a country that you do not know, where people speak other languages that you do not understand. We, interveners, we interact with local people all day long, but there are times when you want to eat your own food, listen to your own music, speak your own language. And then my interviewee looked at me in the eyes and she said, you and I, we have millions of things in common. And you have to realize, I've never met this person before. And clearly, we have very different backgrounds in terms of national origin, professional affiliations, and organizational affiliations. And yet she said, you and I, we have millions of things in common. You and Congolese, you have two or three things in common apart from work. This is why the expats go together, because the expats in any country need to have a place where they can go and sit down just so they are in their own world. It is necessary to keep you sane and anchored. And I heard this kind of deep emotional talks from all kinds of interveners, no matter which country they came from, what functions they had, or which organizations they came, they, which organization they worked for. The other element that helped reinforce the feeling of community, despite all of the internal divisions and tensions, is the presence of others against whom interveners construct their group identities. And um, again, it's very clear from the quote on the slide, you and I, we have millions of things in common, you and Congolese, you have two or three things in common apart from work. And these others are notably the so-called local, so the local authorities and populations who are the intended beneficiaries of the international intervention. And it's important to note that local people share responsibility for the separation that exists between them and international interveners. In many settings, local people treat all interveners as alike and separate from themselves, regardless of the expatriates' national origins, profession, or organizational affiliation. This reinforced the sense of community among interveners, and it further widened, widened the split between interveners and local people. Local people also make it regularly extremely difficult for interveners to integrate in their surrounding communities, as the quote that I put on the slide illustrates. So this, I found it particularly interesting because this is a quote from one of the exceptional interveners whom I interviewed. He had spent eight years in Congo. He had learned local languages. He had tried to develop strong friendship with Congolese people. He had married a Congolese woman and he had a child who was half Congolese. And yet he felt that only his wife and his immediate relatives fully accepted him while well, none of his other contacts did. And that's a complaint that I heard many times when I was interviewing interveners who tried to break the boundaries between them and local populations. And my point here is that turning to other expatriates for support is a perfectly understandable response to the daily difficulties of intervening on the ground in conflict zones. It's often the only thing that enables interveners to function in the difficult environments that they face. But this habit has unintended consequences, which include the construction of firm boundaries between interveners and local people. And I show in the book that many other everyday routines and narratives that interveners have to follow on the ground just to be able to live and work on an everyday basis also have the same kind of unintended consequences. Take the very fact of having to help be one's primary objective and identifying local populations and authorities as beneficiaries. This actually embodies a claim to the moral high ground, as was evident in the saying that constantly recurred in my interviews in Burundi, Sudan, and Cyprus, uh, no, Burundi, Sudan, and Congo. Uh, the hand that gives is always higher than the hand that receives. Take also 
the intervener standard security routines, uh, such as living in compounds, you know, with the high walls and the barbed wires, and driving uh, in these big cars with the doors locked and the windows closed. These standard security routines are perfectly understandable responses to danger. But at the same time, they further separate interveners from local populations. In the words of a Kenyan interviewee, they transform expatriates into other kinds of human beings. They also reinforce the data collection and analysis problems that interveners face because they curtail the, the, the expatriates' knowledge of the local realities that they want to change. And in the book, I also study other kinds of everyday practices and habits, such as striving to remain neutral or impartial, advertising actions, perpetually, perpetually writing reports, and, um, and, uh, advertise and quantifying the results of actions. And I show, again, that all of these routines are perfectly understandable and reasonable responses to the daily difficulties of intervening on the ground in conflict zones. They enable interveners to function in the difficult environments that they face, but they also have unintended consequences that sharply decrease the effectiveness of intervention efforts. And again, the individuals and organizations who challenge these personal and professional routines who remain low profile and avoid, avoid, avoid advertising their actions who develop personal and social relationships with their local counterparts, and who forego standard security routines, these people end up implementing initiatives that are much more effective. So to wrap up, because my time is up, um, the projects, the book suggests a new approach to the study of international peace building, an approach focused on the everyday practice of peace building on the ground. This new approach produces findings that are different from those of existing research. While existing research on international peace building emphasizes the differences among interveners, my research highlights commonalities among them. And in contrast to the body of research on the liberal peace, I argue that these, commonali these commonalities reside less in shared representations, such as a shared adherence to liberal values, the lie instead in the everyday practice of peace building on the ground. And these new findings suggest a fresh answer to the question of what affects the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of international peace building. Macro level policies, strategies, institutions, and discourses are not the only determinant of peace building effectiveness. The everyday practice of peace building on the ground also matters tremendously. And it is by looking at these everyday practices and habits that we can understand why interveners contribute to perpetuating modes of operation that they know are inefficient, ineffective, or even counterproductive. Everyday practices, habits, and narratives enable interveners to function in conflict zones, but they also have a number of in unintended consequences that decrease the effectiveness of international efforts. So this is a very brief summary of a 350-page book. <laughs> and uh, my analysis is, of course, much more detailed than what I've been able to say in a 30 minutes presentation. I have also developed a lot of policy recommendations based on this analysis. I have something like 20 pages of that in the book. Uh, so I'm more than happy to give you more details on the policy recommendations or on any of my points, any of the points of my analysis during the discussion, if you're interested. Thank you so much. You now have an opportunity to ask questions. And we have a mic right there. So please line up at the mic, and uh, you'll, you'll get your chance. Uh, identify yourself when you ask uh, your question. Uh, while you're doing that, uh, I'm going to ask a question myself. And um, Severine, it has to do with um, your uh, criticism of the, the concept of the liberal peace, which uh, you say in practice often turns into a technocratic 
idea that there's only one way to do things right, and it's the, the way that the international experts know how to build the rule of law or uh, create state institutions of the liberal state, uh, and that this, this uh, is a concept that justifies not taking advantage of local knowledge of the way things work in the, the culture and the locality, uh, not making better use of uh, local people in positions of authority. Uh, and you, when you talk about this, it sounds as if uh, you're mostly talking about ways of implementing that would be better if local knowledge and local people were tapped better and respect, respected more. But I'm wondering whether the only thing that's affected is the ways of doing things and the means, or whether it's also the final goals that are affected if you take the view, uh, we're not here to implement liberal rule of law, we're here to make social stability and social, social peace. And if it means using the, the peace building conventional wisdoms that are embedded deep in the culture that aren't liberal, well, that's what we need to do. So is, is there a loss not just of, a, a, of a method, but, but also a change of content that goes along with your recommendation? There can, is the mic working? Yes. Yeah, okay. There, there can be, not necessarily, but there can be. Um, as, you're, as you're saying, if we change the means, uh, there will be a change of goals when, uh, when the means to achieve stability, peace and stability includes uh, using practices that are not liberal and uh, that, that, that do not conform with the values of Western liberal societies. The thing is that most of the time, and unfortunately I don't have quantitative that data on that because it's impossible, but the anecdotal evidence suggests that it's, there is very rarely a clash in terms of values. Um, it's, it's really not the, the end goal, everybody agrees with the end goal, it's really the means that are the problem. So let's say that you have a 90% 90 90 of the cases in which changing the means won't change the goal, the eventual goal, uh, and you have 10% of the cases in which yes, you would, or 5% of the cases in which yes, you would have a change of goals. So uh, to me, changing, changing the means may change the goal at the end, but it's, it's gonna be very, in, in a few cases, in, in a minority of the cases, a very small minority of the cases. Thanks. Uh, please, uh, identify yourself. My name's Gary Gehagen. My only credential is really as a Peace Corps volunteer in Niger. So I watched uh, the missionaries who had excellent local skills, but really no power in the community. I watched USAID and some of the, uh, all the different aid organizations, uh, some better integrated and some not. Um, but I, w what I didn't hear, what I was listening for is where you see the success of better skills. Uh, maybe it was in Algeria, something where we don't, I don't think of the international community as bringing that to, uh, to satisfaction or to stability for a while. I'm not sure I can think of other successful places where better integration led to better success. Um, the, one of my reactions also is um, we don't have to create things in liberal values, but in some ways the locals, we are forcing on them everywhere, you know, in the, the war-torn places, um, the equality of women and that women are people with rights. And that one, we have a very hard time giving up. That's enough for me. Thank you so much. Yes, now on, on where do we see the exceptions and where, where do we see things working? Um, I've, I actually tried to find a place, a geographic area, either a country or a village where the interveners would get everything right. Um, so that's why I went to Timor-Leste and that's why I went to Burundi because at the time of my fieldwork, these two places were uh, usually portrayed as the success cases of international peace building. And the place where everybody was telling me, especially for Timor-Leste, they were telling me, well, people are much more integrated 
integrated, they stay much longer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I really looked for cases that were that were different from what I was saying. And every time I arrived in these countries after doing research, I realized that uh, the everyday practice of peace building on the ground was exactly the same. So what that means is that we don't have a geographic area, uh, like a country or even a village. I also did that at the village level, asking for places where things were different and trying to find a village where the, the entire community of interveners would get things right. Um, and I, there was none. I didn't, well, maybe it exists, but I didn't find it. Um, and I've really looked hard for it. So what I have is rather individuals or organizations or units within organizations that would get things right. And most of the time, I, I, I don't even have an organization where I can say, like, they, uh, they challenge every single one of the dominant practices that I mention in my book. It's rather that they, they challenge one or more of them, but they still continue to use some of the others. Uh, so what I, I do in the book, and I, I can tell you lots of stories about that, is that for each of the dominant practice that I, that I analyze as being detrimental, uh, I show that there are people in different parts of the world working for any kind of different organizations, whether the United Nations or non-governmental organizations. Or the, I, tr I really try to have a variety of, of examples or, or foreign ministries, etc. And who, 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 who do things differently and who, by doing things differently, are much more effective. Uh, but again, for each, for each of these examples, that will be specific to that dominant practice and specific to that individual or organization or unit. So it's very difficult to generalize uh, and to say, well, you know, go to this village or go to that country and you're going to see effective peace building in practice. Hi, I'm Delaney Simon. I'm a former student of both Professor Snyder and Professor Atasar, but now I work at the permanent mission of Afghanistan to the United Nations. Um, and I'm wondering, this sort of touches on your past answer, but the countries that you look at are so different in terms of culture, in terms of location, in terms of the level of state that's there. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about the sort of variation in the local context and in the country context and how that impacts peace building practices. Thanks. Yeah, no, and, and that's, that's exactly what, where I chose all of these countries. I really try to have as much variation as possible on things that we think will, 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 um, will matter for effective peace building. So I try to look at rich countries. I, I looked at the literature and basically every single uh, element that scholars and practitioners has, uh, had identified as having an effect on effective peace building. And I chose my countries to make sure that I had variation on all of these dimensions. So I looked at big and small countries rich and, and poor countries, dangerous and not dangerous countries. I could go on and on. Uh, I have something like 15 criteria. Um, and, and the thing is that there were a lot of local variations uh, in, in the local context. So, uh, for example, the, the dynamics of violence in Congo are very different from the dynamics of violence in Afghanistan and in Kosovo and in Cyprus and in Timor-Leste. But what I found fascinating is that despite all of the differences in the local context, the interveners I was studying, they would act the same way. I would see so many similarities in the way they reacted, the, the way they approached these local dynamics, the way they reacted to violence, uh, and the way, the way they led their lives on an everyday basis, the way they went about collecting information uh, from, from local people and so on and so forth. And to me, and, and so in the book I present only the, uh, the similarities, the things that are you know, cross-cutting, no matter whether, you know, no matter the local context, no matter whether you're in a rich country, in a poor country, dangerous, not dangerous, big, small, um, functioning government, not functioning government, et cetera, et cetera. Because to me, that's what's really fascinating, is that despite all of the differences between the different countries, we still have this group of people who goes from conflict zone to conflict zone and act the same way wherever they are. And to me, that's, that's really the fascinating part of the book. Hi, um, my name is uh, Jeremy Pam. I'm a visiting scholar at the Saltzman Institute. Um, thanks very much for your very interesting presentation. Um, I, uh, my, my relevant experience is mostly as a, a, a U.S. official working in embassies uh, in uh, Baghdad and Kabul, and it's very interesting to hear uh, your uh, argument that uh, the behavior that I uh, had uh, partly attributed to those particular circumstances 
uh, where, of course, the security situation is particularly difficult and um, the uh, community of interveners is particularly large, actually are much broader. Uh, it's not limited to, uh, to uh, the Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, I'd, I'd like to, but my question is, is a, a, a bit theoretical. I want to uh, uh, probe you a little on, on how you are thinking about um, uh, three concepts that you referred to in your presentation, simplicity, uh, complexity, and unintended consequences. Uh, you, you made the argument that uh, obstacles to data collection, to collection of local knowledge, um, results in reliance on simple and simplistic narratives. Um, and uh, I, th I think you said that uh, where others have tried to introduce more complex complexity, um, uh, they have uh, uh, had so, so far had, had uh, little effect. Um, and that is a little, is, is, it was a little surprising to me in light of your uh, emphasis elsewhere on uh, unintended consequences, which I agree with you is uh, a central uh, and underappreciated concept of peace building um, interventions. Uh, uh, you know, many of the things that uh, well-intentioned interveners do result in uh, consequences uh, not contemplated or planned, uh, sometimes positive, uh, as Albert Hirschman always uh, uh, tried to uh, r remind us, but, but often negative, uh, and, and in any case, unpredicted, uh, which is frightening. Um, but, but I've thought from that a focus on unintended consequences, which I think is, is, is absolutely proper, uh, leads me to, to an appreciation of simplicity in uh, intervention approaches uh, rather than complex uh, intervention approaches. Uh, because if you are doing a complex uh, intervention that has many elements and it uh, more or less inevitably produces some unintended consequences, it's very difficult for you to understand which of the, the elements of the complex intervention have produced the unintended consequence. Whereas a simple intervention um, is, uh, is perhaps a little easier to, uh, to try to understand the, the, the causation. Um, and so uh, I guess my question, I, I think I understand your general point uh, and agree with entirely your general point about the, the importance of um, nuanced approaches that are informed by uh, deep understanding of local knowledge. Um, but I wonder whether you're sort of using simple versus complex as shorthand um, uh, as interventions, uh, using it as shorthand for uh, something uh, that's more like nuanced, a concept that's more like nuanced or uh, local knowledge informed. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, it's it's very important. I, I think the, the 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 main the main thing I have to clarify is that when I'm talking about simple and simplistic, I'm talking about the narratives, uh, the way we understand the conflict. So, for example, thinking that. Congo, I've mentioned the narratives, but uh, other narratives would be that um, in, um, in Somalia, it's all due to the failure of the states. Uh, in um, Sierra Leone, it's all blood diamonds, and so on and so on. So this focus on very simplistic narratives, on, and, and these simplistic narratives orient the strategies that, um, that, that we use, and these strategies end up um, focusing more on, on things that are that are not as important to resolve violence and to build peace. But I'm not saying that the, the strategies themselves are simple. And that's very important. All of the strategies I've seen, whether it's to respond to simple narratives, like, uh, for example, to, to, to end sexual violence in Congo, the strategies are not simple at all. All of the strategies that are put in place, there is an, a huge variety of strategies, and, there is, and they are all extremely complex. It's basically trying to redesign uh, Congolese societies and, and the way people think about sexual violence. So there is no simplicity in the, in the strategies on the ground. Uh, there is, um, there is com a lot of complexity already, and it's already extremely difficult to trace the causal process and to trace the unintended consequences. Uh, so I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that we should make interventions even more complex. What I'm saying is that the complexity of the intervention should change. 
uh, and the basis of this complexity should change and it shouldn't come only from our head and what us as interveners and as foreigners think would be good for countries like Afghanistan or Congo or Somalia, but rather to come, come from what we know uh, because there is an international expertise that our local people in conflict zones do value and they do say they want to, to benefit from it, but also from the experience and the expertise of people who are, uh, who are the targets of these interventions. Uh, hi, my name is Matt Connolly. I'm in the history department. Um, so I, I really enjoyed your presentation. I'm looking forward to reading the book. But I, I thought you begged a really big question, which is if it's inefficient and ineffective and counterproductive, in what ways, considering how it continues you know, over years and decades, in what ways is it efficient and effective and productive? So, so what work is it doing, you know, this work of international peace building? Um, I remember it was about five years ago, I was in Bangladesh uh, one night when the Bengal rifles rose up and slaughtered their officers, I mean dozens of them. Uh, and the reason I found out was that it was because these soldiers didn't uh, have the opportunity to participate in UN peacekeeping missions. Because this is considered extremely well paid work, it brings free equipment, there are a lot of perks that come with it. And so this is one obvious way you know, in which uh, peace building can be a career, right? It can mm -hmm. be an opportunity. I mean, that's a relatively simple idea, but I think there are probably others maybe more complex. So for instance, if it required you know, creating a new mission every time uh, with, made up of anthropologists, historians, et cetera, you know, who understood the society and knew what to do, um, it would be harder to make peace building a career, right? Where you could travel from one country to the next. It would also be harder for the UN uh, Department of Peacekeeping Operations to command the resources it needs you know, if they didn't focus on issues like violence against women that are more likely to bring a donor response. So there a lot, there's a lot of work going on. You know, there are a lot of efficiencies in this system, the way it works. It's just they're not necessarily working towards their stated goals. So I'm wondering if you could comment on what goals are they working towards and fulfilling? Because I think that would help us understand why it would be so difficult to change these kinds of practices. You know, he's a friend. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, the efficient, the, basically that's what I refer to as vested interest, and that's what the literature usually uh, studies as being the vested interest of people in the system or the organizations who are part of the system. So these vested interests, for example, would be for the peacekeepers, as you say, whether it's a Bangladeshi peacekeeper or an Indian one or someone from Nigeria, all of them were telling me when I was doing interviews that it's, it's, it's highly valued for them uh, to participate in peacekeeping mission because, as you say, they get a lot of perks, they get you know, higher salary, they get uh, the prestige, they get training, they get equipment, etc., and so on and so forth. And what's interesting is that you would think that for people who come from rich countries like the United States, for example, that you know they don't have any of these kind of perks for party. Well, they do because it gives them exposure to combat situations, um, and it's actually much nicer for them to work in in a place like Congo than to work in Afghanistan or in Iraq. Uh, so I heard also a lot of we want to, and for the Australian or was it the Irish? I mean, there are a couple of countries for which the country is not at war and hasn't been at war for the past, you know decades, and so the only way for them to have ex exposure to combat situation is to participate in peacekeeping missions, and that's very important if they want to be promoted, and so on and so forth. And you have the same thing for non-governmental organization staff members, for diplomats. It includes material rewards, like promotion, like status, like um, pay. Um, it includes um, just social rewards, like the prestige of going back and saying, I work in humanitarian aid, or you know, I come back from Afghanistan, from Congo, these kind of things. Um, so there are a lot of personal interests, and for the organizations, of course, uh, you, you have organizational interest in trying to show that you're relevant, in trying to get more funding uh, than the others, and so f the organizations as well have all of these kind of vested interests. But the thing is that there is an enormous literature on that. Like, seriously, if we go downstairs in, in the library, there are bookshops and bookshelves uh, on these vested interests. And they exist, and they are influential, but no matter what the vested interest, and, and it goes back to one of the questions I had about, do you see differences in local circumstances? Yes, but I still see similarities. Do you see differences in terms of vested interests? So yes, there are people who are very selfish, people who are very altruistic, but what's really interesting is that whether you're selfish or altruistic, 
realistic, most of the time you will use these everyday practices. And you will use these everyday narratives because there is this understanding that it doesn't matter for the effectiveness of your actions. That this is the way things work, this is the, the way things have always worked, and this is the way things will always work. So it's just what you do when you're an intervener in conflict zones. So I'm not saying that the vested interests don't matter, and they do, and it's proven. What I'm saying is that we need to look, it, it's not the only thing. Even if we fix the, vest, the vested interest problem, we're still going to have to, to, to look at, the, uh, at all of the everyday practices that I document in the book because they have an enormous influence in whether or not you're going to be able to achieve your vested interest. Hello, thank you very much for your um, presentation, wonderful presentation. Uh, my name is Madeline. I'm a student here at SIPA, MPA student. And my question pertains to um, the distance you were talking about between um, interveners and local citizens. I wondered if you could expand on it and, and address um, or talk about if there are differences in that distance depending on um, demographic factors like uh, an intervener's race or uh, m my experience is mostly in sub-Saharan Africa and I know there's a pan-Africanism. So uh, maybe the, a regional, uh, like, a, like the, maybe the Kenyan um, who, is, who is in the Congo, if there's less of a distance because of whatever factors. Yeah, so I, 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 looked, at, I looked at that a lot because I was trying, uh, I was trying to find a, a theory for my exceptions. Um, and so I looked, does it, does it matter whether people come from the same geographic area or does race matter in terms of, of bridging the distance? Does gender matter? Does religion matter? So I, I looked at all of the again, all of the factors that I could think would, would be uh, relevant, and they do not. Uh, and that's, to me, that was really interesting, especially because we always think about, you know, we want to have African solutions to African problems, or in Asia, apparently, it's the same thing, Asian solutions to Asian problems. And what's fascinating is that when I was in Congo, for example, I would ask, I would ask my Congolese friend, but, you know, do, do, you, do you have different relationship with this person who come from Ivory Coast or with this person who come from uh, Kenya? And they were like, but Severin, a foreigner is a foreigner. And what do you think that the person who come from Ivory Coast know about my culture, knows about my history, knows about my identity? If they have studied Congolese culture, history, languages, of course, but otherwise there is no more, you know, there is no, no other thing apart from a history of shared colonization. And that's, that's very important because that's the one thing after doing a lot of interviews on, on this topic, um, the one thing that, uh, that, was, that appeared to be relevant in terms of the relationship between local people and international interveners were that uh, international interveners coming from the same region were better placed to talk about sensitive topics. So for example, sensitive topics linked to um, for example, talking with the president uh, of a country and the president saying, well, you know, all of the problems that we have now is due to colonialism uh, and to the heritage of colonization. Then uh, when you're the colonizer, you say, okay, I'm so sorry, and that's about the only thing that you can say. Uh, when you come from another colonized country and your country is much better off and doesn't have violence, then as a diplomat, you can say, well, my country was colonized for longer than yours and you know, the colonization was even worse, but look at what we've done. My country is democratic and my country is relatively peaceful. So you cannot use the, the uh, you know, colonization does explain something, but you can work, you know, you can work and you can, you can address the legacies of colonialism in a way that will not make your population suffer. So people, you know, people from the regions have this kind of comparative advantage. Uh, otherwise, uh, what, what really bridges the distance between interveners and local people is, is not where you come from, it's not your gender, it's not your religion or any of the other things that I looked at. It's really how you, how you decide to go personally as an intervener and whether, you know, everyday decisions. With whom do you decide that you're gonna have a drink after work? Uh, Non-alcoholic drink if you're in Afghanistan. Uh, is, is it so, are, are you gonna go with other expatriates? Or are you gonna go with the local counterparts whom you met you know, in, in the meeting this afternoon? Um, when on weekends, are you gonna go to the beach with the other expatriates or are you go just gonna stay with your neighbors and hang around there and, and talk with them? And you know, all of these everyday decisions, where are you gonna live? Are you going to re live in the rich, protected neighborhood with all of the other expatriates and all of the other rich people? Or are you going to try to live in a normal neighborhood where you're going to 
be more part of the community, and so on and so forth. And all of these everyday decisions that you make as an individual on an everyday basis, that's really what helps bridge the, the gap between interveners and local people. Hi, um, my name is Maya Bix. I'm a student at Barnard. Um, and my question is about the boundaries you talked about between interveners and, um, and the locals. And uh, you discussed sort of some of these boundaries that, that separate people and their harmful and unintended consequences. But you also talked about this um, fact that many of these boundary or many of these practices that create these boundaries end up being necessary because of safety concerns or for the emotional well-being of the interveners. Um, so how do you change these practices and replace them with ones that, that don't create these harmful boundaries, but at the same time don't make intervening in peacekeeping uh, so uncomfortable or dangerous that it disincentivizes it altogether? Yeah, thank you. That's my policy recommendation. So I was really hoping that someone would ask the question. So thanks. Um, I, well, the, the first thing is that um, we, we need to, I've been talking a, a lot about you know, the lopsided role of thematic versus local knowledge. So first we need to, of course, rebalance the role of local and thematic knowledge uh, because it's gonna make the intervention you know, much more appropriate, much more effective, uh, and that will also help with, the bre with breaking the boundaries. Because let's say if we hire people who, have, who, who speak local languages and who understand already the local cultures and the local histories before coming, of course it's going to be much easier for them to socialize with local people and to have uh, decent relationships because, I mean, we, is there any, if there is any foreigner in the room, uh, you remember when we arrived in the United States, the first week was very difficult to break the boundaries between us and uh, people in this country. But then as we progress with our comment of English and as we progress with our understanding of histories and culture, it's much easier to break boundaries. So knowing local language, know, knowing the local context is already very important. And that's why I think we need to change the recruitment and promotion practices for interveners to emphasize much more, again, when we recruit interveners, the knowledge of local histories, the knowledge of local language, the knowledge of local cultures, and in terms of promotion, to include that in the evaluations, uh, whether they understand local language, what kind of local networks they have developed, and also in the promotion to put more emphasis on how long people stay in a specific country rather than saying if you want a promotion you have to go to another country um, and it's the only way basically to be promoted. So we can, you know, that's, that's a way to, to break the boundaries. Um, we can uh, also have, have ideas for structures that would make it easier for people to interact and to socialize. I have ideas about policies that the organizations could do. Um, local people can have a huge role in breaking these boundaries. Uh, again, you know, by inv inviting interveners to socialize with them, uh, inviting them to mass on Sunday morning if the thing to do on Sunday morning is to go to mass, or in inviting them to parties or to uh, baseball or basketball or football or soccer, whatever, you know, extending invitations for socialization. What's also very important is you mentioned, for example, the uh, security practices, which are, as I mentioned, one of the uh, things that really separate people from local people from interveners. And what's really interesting is that you have two approaches to security. You have the bunkerization approach, which is let's isolate ourselves from our environments, let, let's live in bunkers, and it's really the military approach to security. And then you have what we call the acceptance approach. And the acceptance approach is let's try to have contact with all of the armed groups, with all of the local communities, with all of the stakeholders, and let's try to, to develop good relationship with all of these people. So there has been research, and uh, of course most organizations currently use the bunkerization, the isolation approach. Well, what's interesting is that the few organizations that use the opposite approach, the acceptance approach, they actually have fewer security incidents, and their security incidents are less problematic than uh, for, the, for the people who use the isolation approach. And, and there has been uh, fascinating studies by Larissa Fast. She's, uh, she's at Notre Dame and she has a new book out, Aid in Danger. And uh, by um, Jan Egerland and Abby Stoddard uh, on the security of humanitarian aid workers. And then all of them have colleagues who have done this kind of research as well. So there is really consistent research that shows that by using the acceptance approach, you're making yourself more secure than uh, by isolating yourself from your surrounding. So 
breaking the boundaries between yourself and local populations in many contexts, it's not only going to help, you know, help you have uh, increase the effectiveness of your efforts, but it's also going to make you more secure. Hi, I'm Katrina Kelsick. I'm interning right now with the UN Office on Sexual Violence and Conflict. Thank you so much for the fascinating presentation, and I wanted to revisit the point that you made about the construction of simplistic narratives. Um, so given the absence of local knowledge, country expertise, anthropologists, historians, it seems that these narratives that are kind of told amongst the peacebuilding community are very susceptible to being influenced by different forces. And I was wondering um, how you perceive the potential for parties to the conflict to participate in the construction of this narrative, especially um, as we see in the case of the DRC, different parties could very much benefit from the oversimpli oversimplification of the narrative. Um, and moving forward, I was wondering if how you, how you envision or how you would predict the culture of peace building activities to become more or less aware of the dangers of having simplified narratives and how long you think it might take this culture to change. Thank you so much. Sure, thank you so much for the question. Yeah, no, you, you are entirely right. There, there are a lot of people who benefit and, and a lot of local people who benefit from the construction of these narratives. And that's why they keep, uh, they, they keep sending emails and they keep sending information to try to reinforce the narrative, uh, something that's fascinating on uh, the narrative on, um, on um, mineral resources in Congo. So uh, we put out a letter, an open letter, that was uh, drafted by two, research, two Belgian researchers two months ago. And they got, I think, 70 uh, academics and Congolese, uh, you know, foreign and Congolese academics and foreign and Congolese activists, uh, organization, to say, look, we, we focus too much on, on uh, mineral resources. It's, it's really dangerous. We need to think about the other causes of violence. And then a month later, there was a counter open letter that was published, signed by uh, organizations that have an interest in perpetuating this narrative. And it's not only the people who directly benefit from the trafficking in natural resources, but these are all the, the non-governmental organizations who actually get funding to work on the trafficking of natural resources. So of course they're not going to say, oh, it actually doesn't matter. It's actually worse. Uh, it actually causes only 8% of the conflict, and the no other 92% were doing nothing about it. Of course they're not going to let us say that. Um, so there, there are a lot of people who benefit from these narratives and who, who share information and, and reinforce these kind of narratives. And so when going forward, thinking about how we can have more complexity, that's one of the most difficult things. Uh, and that's why, again, I go back to the idea that we need to have people who understand the local culture, histories, etc., because then they, they are better able to analyze the information. When you know the information comes from someone who has an interest in you acting a certain way, then you interpret your information differently and you discount it. So you need that, but uh, you also need to change some of the standard ways that uh, these organizations operate. So for example, um, my, lots of people I interviewed were telling me about the reporting factor and the fact that in the, rep in the report, uh, a lot of information is filtered out. And at the end, their village or their province gets one sentence or just one paragraph in the briefing to the higher up who takes the decision. So of course, in one sentence or in one paragraph, you cannot explain the whole complexity of the situation. Um, and, and it's the same thing when the briefings are oral, you know, in five minutes, you, you need to really simplify and go to the core. So it's, uh, if we want to change uh, these narratives and to change the reliance on these dominant narratives, we also have to look at, at the very practical, everyday ways of reporting and way of acting within the international organizations. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Luis Vieira, and I have, uh, since 94, I've been in various missions with with the UN system, with NGOs, etc., uh, I happen to spend um, eight years in uh, Timor, so I know that case particularly well. And uh, incidentally, it's, it's, I I think you were there later, but I, I, my experience was that during the crisis of 2006, the the government itself really trusted a, a, a group of expats who knew the language, etc. So it was an interesting experience to know. Ex, um, that mirrors what you're saying in terms of reaching out, engagement with with um, the local communities, etc. Et it's also quite telling, I think, that you went to Timor, I think, in a moment of hostility, because I think the the government 
uh, at least I sense that when I left from 2008 to 2010, by 2010, the, the government, the popular perception of the international community had changed dramatically from the previous time in 2002, et cetera, where we were welcoming, we were seen as, you know, uh, supportive of the liberation, et cetera. So I think it's a very interesting dynamic. But one of the things I was, I was going to ask you, actually I have two questions, one of which is following on Professor Snyder's point about the liberal peace. Uh, how do, you, how do you see this interacting? Because my experience has been that there are structural issues in the way aid works that, that disfavors this approach that you're suggesting. Yeah, you already mentioned reporting, et cetera. But I also, I think that these things are also, from my personal experience, related to an indoctrination of, of people in, in the aid industry that unwittingly, I, I think, obviously, provides this, ends in a, up in a very paternalistic, this, this belief that you have teaching to do, your capacity developing, your capacity. And so that itself is, is a structural, I think. My experience has not been vis-a-vis -vis the personal incentives. I think most people in these situations are not. Of course, it's a question of prestige, et cetera, but I don't think it's a willful instrumentalization of your place. I think it's, it's more internalized. I think you come in from from an instruction that helps you to internalize the way we operate. And then just one other question. I wonder if you can maybe speak a little bit more about, I was very struck by the slide that you put up vis-a-vis -vis the person who had tried to reach out and you know, he tried to build trust, et cetera, and then he or she, I don't know, who, uh, uh, felt undone by the lack of reciprocal trust. And so I wonder if you could speak a little bit about the different layers of communities with whom we work, we work with, with elites, we work with you know, farmers, we work with, so you know, we don't work with homogeneous communities. So maybe if you can talk a little bit about these differences, dynamics within these groups. Thank you. Sure, thank you so much. Um, how much do you want to hear about theory on your, your first question? Um, the, the, what's interesting to me is that yes, there are structural elements in, in everything that I mentioned. But uh, even when, um, so th there are elements first that have nothing to do with the structure. So for example, whether the, the fact that you, you decide or not to live in an expatriate bubble you know, it's individual choice. But you're entirely right that there are structural elements in, you know, the culture, the kind of indoctrination, like we are here to teach them, but otherwise what would be the point of sending a foreign actors if we didn't have the knowledge? Um, and in the security procedures and so on and so on and, and so forth. But what's interesting to me is that you have two ways of reacting to a structure. You can either do, you know, follow what's mandated or you can actually ch try to change the structure. And, uh, that's, and, and the structure, at least in the field of peace building, I've never seen one that fully determines behavior. Uh, all of the times, even for security practices, um, even you know, for, for, for the we think we know better, and et cetera, et cetera, there are always people who challenge the structure and who try to change it. And to me, it, it means that, uh, I mean, it means two things important. The first one is that the structure doesn't determine all of the behavior. The second is that there is an, indi uh, an element of individual choice. And the third thing is that we can change the structure. And uh, that's why I'm insisting so much on the exceptions, is to show really that it's not a structural, it's not necessarily a structural issue, but it's also really an issue of individual decision on the ground. And of course, the structure and the individual decisions they will reinforce each other because the individual decision can be either to perpetuate the structure and to reinforce the structure or to challenge it and to change it. Uh, and that leads to the policy recommendation and how we can actually reform the system is by following, following the people who actually try to change the structure and to try, who try to challenge it. On the, <clears throat> on the different levels of uh, people with whom we work, that's, that's also fascinating because um, the, so as you said, there are the elite, uh, there are to me, this, the local staff, uh, uh, who are very important, the people with whom we interact on an everyday basis, uh, and who are a class unto themselves, uh, because they are really the translator of what happens uh, in their countries to most international people, uh, translator also culturally speaking. They are the ordinary citizen, and they are, uh, you know, a, a whole different category of people. What's really, uh, what's really important is that 
in terms of interaction, there is sometimes interaction with the elite, uh, especially when the elite has been, um, has been educated in our own educational system. So people who've come and who've done a master's degree at Columbia or at Harvard or, or places like that and who speak our language, there is much less interaction with ordinary people unless uh, people start developing romantic relationship with uh, someone from the local populations and then that's how they get to meet the family. That or religious experience, so people who go to mosque or who go to church, then they start developing relationship with local people, but otherwise most of the relationship that I've seen is mostly with the elite, again, because the elite speaks a language that we understand. And when I say they speak a language that we understand, it can be either an actual language, but also they speak in ways that we understand. We have cultural references in common, so it's easier to interact and to socialize together. So since we do want to leave some time for uh, schmoozing and for book signing at the end, let's keep questions short and possibly even keep <laughs> answers short. And uh, also, if you want to collect uh, yep. questions, that's yep. your call. Yep. Uh, thank you so I'll much, Severine. Um, I found what you shared very profound um, and very important. Um, I'm, my name is Monica, and I'm completing my studies here at SEPA. And um, I'm an aspiring peace builder. Um, and I found what you said about narratives very compelling. Um, it reminded me a lot of what Paul Farmer at one point in time said that accompaniment was the willingness to share the fate of another. And so as an aspiring peace builder, my question to you is, what is the narrative that I as, an, as a peace builder um, need to tell myself when I'm in the field that will serve as my North Star, as my compass, informing me of what are the values and the questions that I reflect on on a daily basis to really allow me to stay true to what I'm trying to do, which is to be in the service of peace. Go ahead, we're gonna collect the last three. Hi, my name is Rebecca Engel. I was directing CICR's program in Timor for many years, so I'm, it's a pleasure to finally meet you in person. Um, I just wanted to raise a couple of issues that are a little bit interrelated that I thought were interesting. Your res presentation resonated um, with me very much. Um, but one is, is related to the fact that on, on the ground and operationally, I think very few people actually consider themselves, even though these are peace building and conflict affected countries, nobody, it's very difficult to find people who are actually speaking about conflict resolution, conflict prevention or peace building. It's, it's not part of the program design, it's not part of the discourse, it's, and so I think that has an impact also in how you approach issues of political economy, conflict analysis, and your, your own approach and interventions. Um, and that's also related, I think, to some of the structural elements and about how people come in with a certain liberal mo economic model and, and framework that is a, a pretty prefabricated and very difficult to, to look at more complex and nuanced responses that are conflict sensitive and appropriate and locally informed. And I think just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Hi, I'm Thomas Gilchrist. I'm a former SEPA student and a former human rights worker, uh, mostly with experience in Central Africa and West Africa. Uh, Severina, I wanted to invite you to unpack one piece of what you're talking about, which is you've talked a lot about how, but since I'm a former human rights worker, I want to do some naming and shaming. So can you talk about <laughs> The, which organizations and which types of organizations could do the most to be, to, to have the most impact to, to, if they change their practices? Where's the scope the greatest and where's the need the greatest in this revolution that you're talking about? And then with that, do you have a plan for how to enact that? Thanks. Great, thank you, and that's the perfect last question. Um, on, on the narrative, um, I, I think that would be something like, that, that would, my advice would be, think about what you can actually bring like, you know, I, I know that I have this expertise, that thing, that thing. These are the three things that I actually can bring to people. I don't know it all. Uh, I don't know it all. I know the three things, and, I, and with the three things, I can actually help people on the ground. But no matter what, I'm going to try to remain a decent human being. 
And that's really important. No, but seriously, it is extremely important because a lot of the time when you're, when you're on the ground, things are so stressful and you're so focused on bringing your three things uh, or on bringing your technical expertise on making sure that your project is going to work well. You have to deal on top of that with security uh, issues. You have to deal with the fact that you're away from people you love. You have to deal with the fact that uh, everything is extremely stressful. And, and that, brings, that really brings out the worst in many people. And no, but seriously, it's true, uh, I've, myself included. Um, and, and the thing is that we sometimes I, I, I remember being with, sharing drinks with friends and I saying, well, we've become exactly the kind of people that we would hate, uh, that in normal life we would hate because we're impatient, we believe that we know it all, we don't want to listen to people because we want just to go ahead and implement our program. And uh, one of my, my friends uh, at, at the end said, well, you know, I need to leave this kind of, a, I need to leave Peaceland, I need to leave this kind of international system to, come, to become again the person I used to be. Um, and another the one was much more positive and he said, well, I just have to remind myself every day that I, I want to be a decent human being and I have, uh, in addition to everything that I can bring technically and in terms of knowledge, I really have to, to remain a decent human being. So that would be my narrative. That would be, I can bring these three things but I don't know it all and above all I want to remain a decent person. Um, on, on the... <clears throat> On, on the fact that they, uh, where's Susanna? Uh, yeah, on, on the fact that they can't, uh, the, the fact that they don't, they don't include local the word conflict resolution or peace building in the actual mandate, uh, that's actually something that uh, Susanna Campbell has, I don't know if you know her, her research, it's one of the things that she has studied, is uh, whether it makes a difference whether people include the word peace building or conflict resolution and whether they have that as a central goal or not. And she has found it, made, it makes a difference. Uh, so that's one of the other things, she's publishing her research right now so it's gonna come out. Uh, and it's one of the fascinating findings. So yes, it does, it does make a difference in addition to the everyday practices and the vested interest and uh, all of the constraints that it mentioned that we mentioned. And on the naming and shaming, um, yes. <laughs> uh, Okay, uh, it's obvious the United Nations is the one that could have, I mean, first it's, it's the way it works is prof profoundly problematic right now. Um, and it could have the most impact by changing its everyday practices just because it is such a large organization that is so powerful, symbolically powerful, that has so much money, so many people working for them. They have so many offices and material and things in all of the world country that if I were to change one organization, I would focus my efforts on the United Nations just because, just because that would be more effective. So my strategy to do that, um, I'm, I'm doing briefing. I'm, I'm, I've, I know my book has circulated that the United Nations among people who've either who knew me before or people who've emailed me and told me well my entire unit has read your book and we really like it and you know we're working on it so and also um, I've I was invited to do uh, a briefing of all of the people who work in peace building at the United Nations they have a peace building contact group that means I think once or twice a year in New York and I was invited to present my finding at uh, at this at the meeting of this uh, United Nations peace building commission so that's that's one of my way of engaging is trying to, to brief people and I, I'm doing other briefing for other non-governmental organizations in New York uh, and, and for the French Defense Ministry when I'm in Paris, etc. So it's just trying to engage as much as possible with these people and try to communicate the findings and, and hope that I will convince as many people as possible and then they will carry on and take the next step which is to think about how to implement these reforms within their own organizations. Severine's now going to practice what she preaches. She's going to step down from the dais and mingle with the audience, although we have a social situation that's unequally structured around <laughs> you signing your autograph. But I, I'm sure you'll do it in the least arrogant way possible. 